Hello, good evening. Welcome to another episode of Brett's Old Time Radio Show. I am running so late tonight. It is absolutely crazy. Right, now, listen, uh, thank you for joining us. The weather forecast was rubbish today, but let me tell you something. The sun has been shining pretty much all day. It's been lovely. It's been a really lovely day. I hope it's been nice where you are. Now, I'm going to, I'm in a rush. Please do check out our sister podcast, which is called Sunday Night Mystery, because it's brilliant. And I'm not going to chat because I am so late. I'm just going to crack on and introduce the Saturday night episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This one first broadcast on the 7th of April, 1951. It's called The Edward French Matter. I'm so sorry I'm late. I can't believe it. It's, we've just had such a busy day. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as Johnny Dollar. French speaking, who is this? Oh, I'm sorry for my explosive greeting, Mrs. French. It's a habit I've gotten into. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. Oh, yes, I received the message that you'd called. But I don't think I understand you're coming to Chicago. Well, I guess they haven't got around to writing you about it. They sent me here to talk to you about your son. I see. And then if we decide there are grounds for your fears about him, they've given me authority to go out to the Malay States and investigate the situation. Oh, that's very nice of them. I am afraid for Edward. I'll come out to see you about 1.30 then, Mrs. French. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Tri-State Insurance Group, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Edward French matter. Expense account item one, $95 airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Chicago, the home of Edward French's mother. There the story went about as follows. Edward French had left the States after the war and gone to the Malay States, where he managed a tea plantation, concentrating on sales to a buyer for the Jewel Tea Company. He married an English girl, and their life seemed pleasant enough, but a letter from a constable Wicklow had reported the abrupt end of that. Edward, on a business trip to Singapore, had disappeared. The current crop of Malay guerrillas was suspected, but there was not one clue as to whether he was alive or dead. Expense account item three, $1,283 airfare to Singapore. It was almost a week later that I jostled my way through the crowded streets to the office of the jewel tea buyer, Mr. Neefs. No, it's hard, Mr. Dollar. You won't believe this, but I was thinking of Ed just as you walked through that door. You knew about the disappearance? Oh, yes. Constable from Raub sent word down a week after he'd been here. Oh, Mr. French did come here after he left his plantation. Yes, we finished our business in the afternoon and went to dinner at the club that night. He left the following morning. Did you hear from him the following morning? Well, no, but I knew that was his plan. Actually, I wasn't worried about him even after I heard about it. Ed's uh, well, not peculiar, I guess, but strong will. If 50 men told him not to swim across the river, he'd do it just to please himself. You get to expect the unexpected from him. I don't know if I make myself clear. I think I understand. Selfish, maybe, better word. What I mean is that it would be like Ed to suddenly leave for some place without bothering to tell anyone. Not even his wife? Well, of course, of all, not his wife. Now, don't misunderstand. I like Ed, but I can't help disapproving of some of the things, uh, like the way he treats Catherine. But none of my business. I like him in spite of those things. I think Ed will show up when he gets ready to and laugh at the trouble he's caused. You don't put any stock in the idea that the gorillas might have got him, huh? Bandits, I understand you call them. Uh, yes, well, of course, there's always that possibility. A planter is killed now and then, but I'd expect Ed to be the last one. If he just took off someplace, as you suspect, would you have an idea where he'd go? No, I'm afraid I wouldn't. It's a big world, you know. Yeah. How do I get to Raub? <laughs> I began to appreciate the state of siege British Malaya is living under when I boarded the train the next morning. All the windows and all the cars were covered with wood, hard and thick enough to withstand fair-sized bullets. At the stopping point near Aoub, I was met by two native policemen armed with brain guns who drove me the rest of the way in a jeep that had been encased in armor. There was no trouble, but by the time I reached the police station in Raoub, 
I had a healthy respect for the dank wall of jungle that pushed in from all sides and the unseen enemy it hid. Because on the way, I was notified by the native driver that Constable Wicklow had been killed from ambush the day before. His replacement was Constable Downs. It's a nasty business, cleaning them up. Poor Wicklow had been anti for almost a year. Well, it must have happened after I talked to the police in Singapore. Yes, last night. They attacked a steward estate. That adjoins French's. Wicklow was killed on the way out with reinforcements. They'll single out the leader every chance they get. What do you know about French's disappearance? Very little, I'm afraid. I read Wicklow's report when I learned you were coming. Undoubtedly, the work of the bandits. Although it might appear to be kidnapping. Kidnapping? That's a new theory. Oh, hardly a theory yet. But it's not been their habit to conceal the bodies of their victims. This is the first case on record where a vehicle has been taken. I didn't know about that either. That's what Wicklow's report said. That's all I know about it. Mm. Constable, I want to go out and talk with his wife. Uh, how do you... Oh, uh, take the jeep, by all means. It, it's rather late in the afternoon to start out. If you can't be sure of getting back here before dark, well, there's hardly any possibility that you'll take a chance. The native boys simply won't start back. They'll stay behind the barricade there for the night, and so will you. The French estate, like the others, maintained about 50 private soldiers who held defensive positions about the place 24 hours a day. By the time I got there, they had pulled in for the night and were manning a tight perimeter around the main house. As the jeep passed through it, I saw that they were fairly well armed with rifles, light automatic weapons, and grenades. In sight of all this, waiting on the veranda, and dressed as though she were about to leave for a cocktail party, Mrs. French looked entirely out of place. Mrs. French? Yes? Oh, uh, didn't Constable Downs telephone about my coming? He said he would. Constable Downs? Uh, I'm afraid he wasn't able to. Our telephone wires have been out. Oh. Well, my name is Dollar, Mrs. French. How do you do? I'm here from the States to investigate the disappearance of your husband. The United States? I don't understand. I was sent by the insurance company that carries the policy on his life. It's quite a big policy, you know. Yes. Please, sit down. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dollar, you must understand what our fears are, that Edward has been killed by the bandits. There's no proof of that yet. As a matter of fact, Constable Down seems to think there's a fair possibility that he hasn't been. What did he say? That they never bother to hide anyone they've killed, and your husband's body hasn't been found. Also, that they never steal cars, and your husband's car hasn't been found. I... I haven't dared to help. What does he think it means? I don't think he's sure, but he mentioned kidnapping. I didn't know until I talked to him that your husband had been in his car when he disappeared. Does that mean that he drove to Singapore? Yes, he always drove. Through more than 200 miles of jungle during an emergency like this? Why would he do that? Because everybody told him that he shouldn't. My husband was... Uh, was like that. You're convinced that he's dead, aren't you? Well, I... I haven't dared to hope. I, I've thought the worst of that if... Please! This is French. Where did they come from? It's hard to tell. That way, I thought. <laughs> Uh, you'd better sit down, Mrs. French. Come on. Come on, sit down. <laughs> About 15 minutes later, I thought I understood her violent reaction to the shots in the far distance. A small lorry pulled up in front of the house, and a blonde man of 30 or so years got out of it. He was introduced to me as Keith Stewart, manager of the adjoining estate. From one brief look that passed between Mrs. French and him, I thought I understood who she had been afraid for. Well, I dare say that nobody would travel all the way out here if I caught it. You Americans are a surprising lot. Yes, I suppose so. And by the way, I very nearly did catch it. We heard the shooting. How many were there, Keith? Hard to tell. As usual, I could scarcely see the beggars. But their number's not as important as the fact that they're still in the vicinity after last night. I'm afraid we shall have to expect another raid tonight. The telephone lines have been cut. Yes, I rather thought they had. I tried to call. That's why I popped over. I think we can expect them here tonight. Is that your jeep, Mr. Dollar? Constable Downs let me use it. I wouldn't try to return to Raoub until morning if I were you. (laughs) 
two hours later, it was dark. A double guard had been posted and floodlights glared out in a 200-yard circle around the house. There was a rather strange supper shared by Mrs. French, Keith Stewart, and myself. The association between the two was obvious to me by the time coffee was served, and the rest of it came out later that night. I couldn't sleep in the uneasy house, and at 11, I left my room to go get some air on the veranda. But they were already there. And what I overheard from inside the house just about settled the case as far as I was concerned. I was waiting for a definite statement when the conversation was interrupted. They're here. Go inside, Captain. What is it, Stuart? Well, sir, did our little war awaken you? I wasn't asleep. You said you had a weapon for me? Yeah. Yeah. Go inside, Captain. All right. Please be careful. Right over here, Mr. Dollar. Not a gun of American manufacture. Are you familiar with the Thompson product? Yeah, thanks. You'll have to arm it. The chamber's empty. Now then, you're going out there with me? That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Very good. Rather an odd way to carry on an insurance investigation, isn't it? That's right. But you would hardly call this an ordinary case. return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. There have been some changes made, and it's faster, it's funnier, it's got new life and brand new punch, because Jan Murray's taken over. What show is this? Why, CBS's Saturday Night Musical Quiz, Sing It Again, that hour of melody, mirth, and money that's heard on most of these same CBS stations. Yes, Jan Murray is your new host. Alan Dale, Judy Lynn, the Riddlers, and Ray Block are your music makers. And there's still loads and loads of cash for identifying the phantom voice. Be sure to hear the new Sing It Again starring Jan Murray tonight on CBS. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Keep that lane covered. We've other guns to look about for targets. There's a movement to the left, Stuart. Good man, two of them. Take them if you like. There's a hundred of them. The main force, all right. Swing your fire! You men, concentrate on their rear. You two don't. Swing them out! We'll be in the enfilade position. Gave you a bit of a go last night, I'm told. It was over by 2 a.m. I'm sorry I got your men into it, Constable. Oh, nonsense. They're policemen. You brought them both back, didn't you? Yes, the one debt we had was a boy from the estate. Ah, oh, beastly business. What about the bandits? I don't know. I didn't stay to count. There's been a development in the French disappearance that will probably surprise you. Oh? I overheard a private conversation between Stuart and Mrs. French. Or at least they thought it was private. I can think only one thing after hearing what they said. They're back of French's disappearance, not the bandits. Oh, see here now. I told you it would be a surprise, but it's the truth. You suspect that there's something between them? It's more than a suspicion. I know that to be a fact. Good Lord. They talked about whether or not French knew about their association and whether or not he'd mentioned it to somebody who could have told me about it. She's afraid I'm suspicious of them, she said. What else could they have been talking about, Constable? I don't know. Uh, good Lord. Did it sound as though they'd killed him? Yes, it did. 
But unfortunately, an overheard conversation isn't much in the way of proof. No, no. Pity the body hasn't been found. That would help. He didn't say so, but I sort of assume that Stuart has a wife. Is that right? Yes, he has. Rather a pathetic, sickly woman. You can't say that about Mrs. French. Oh, no, no. I, I suppose one couldn't. I wonder if you could call Stuart into town for something this afternoon. Maybe a report on last night's actions. I'd like to talk to his wife. Why, yes. Yes, I imagine I could. I'll ask two or three of the planters. Uh, as a matter of fact, I should arrange a meeting to discuss common defense. But good Lord, Dollar, this possibility is astounding. <laughs> It was almost too hot to move when Constable Downs opened his meeting, but I jeeped to the Stewart estate and was admitted to the room where Mrs. Stewart was resting, a pale, fever-ridden woman. Mr. Dollar, you've traveled a great distance in order to ask questions. I find rather strange your hesitancy now that you are here. There are some questions that are particularly hard to ask. They're about your husband, Mrs. Stewart. Yes. Do you know about your husband and Mrs. French? Of course I've known. He's in love with her. And I don't care. Has he spoken of divorce? Under British law, Mr. Dollar. It would be my place to speak of divorce. Why do you ask? I wondered if he or they had any plans for the future. I assure you that any of Keith's plans for the future will include me. Unless he killed me. At times, I wish he would. Do you think Edward French knew about his wife? I don't know. Mrs. Stewart, I don't know if you really think your husband is capable of killing you. But it looks very much as though he did kill Edward French. I hope he did. And I hope he's punished for it. Can you think of anything that... that might help me prove that he did? I... No. Oh, I wish I could remember. The French disappeared about a month ago. Evidently, he left Singapore in his car. If your husband killed him, he would have to have met him on the road back. Can you remember your husband leaving for any length of time about a month ago? Yes. Yes, I do remember. A month ago. He left before noon in his lorry. He was gone for two or three hours. Did he say where he'd gone? No. I asked him, and he said he'd been inspecting the groves. But he was lying. It was hard to know whether she was speaking the truth or what was manufactured by her hate for her husband. When I left her, I went back to the French estate. Mrs. French was reportedly too ill from the previous night's excitement to see me at the moment, and I was told to wait. I waited until an hour before dark and then was faced not by the lady of the estate, but by Keith Stewart. My wife told me about your visit, Mr. Dollar. She did? I was hoping that she wouldn't. I'm sorry that you bothered her. She's quite ill. At times, what she says is entirely no basis of reason. Oh? She seemed to be all right when I saw her. She told you that I killed Edward French. Do you think that's a reasonable statement? She didn't tell me that. And why should she say that she did? Probably because I told her. You told her? Yeah. Why would you think a thing like that, Mr. Dollar? Because it doesn't look like natives work, for one thing. The body hidden, the car missing. That doesn't necessarily follow, Mr. Dollar. A jungle animal might have made off with his body. An armored auto such as his could be sold quite easily for a great deal of money. His body might also offer proof of who killed him. The car, too, possibly. I'm afraid you're in error, Mr. Dollar. Edward was killed by bandits. How do you know that? Considering the number of deaths attributable to them, I think it's safe to assume... You're in love with his wife. I make no secret of that, sir. You made no secret of your conversation with her last night, either. What do you mean? I mean on the veranda last night, just before the attack. I see. You told her there was nothing to worry about, if you'll remember. You were wrong. I'm afraid you were, too, Mr. Dollar. Spying is not looked upon with any amount of favor here. It's not my usual method, but your stupidity made it almost unavoidable. How do you think the murder is going to be received? I insist there was no murder, per se... Edward was killed by the bandits. Keith. Catherine, will you go back to your room, please? No, Keith. I have a right to know what's being said. Nothing is being said, my dear, that would be of any interest to you. Why do you say that, Stuart? I've been listening, Keith. I have a right to be here. All right, my dear. 
As you know, then, we were discussing the possibility that I might have killed your husband. It's a groundless discussion, since even if Mr. Dollar were convinced that I had, there would be the matter of proof. I've been expecting that. And you have a solution? Not at the moment. But let me tell you this. I have Constable Downs convinced, too. He arranged the meeting of you planters this afternoon only to give me time to talk to your wife. Keith. Please, Captain, be quiet. The constable has probably radioed our suspicions to Singapore by now, so you can see that the ball is rolling, so to speak. Catherine, be quiet. Go to your room, Catherine. It'll be better if you go to your room. You can see she's ready to break down right now. I don't think you have a chance, Stuart. She had nothing to do with it, Dollar. I'll accept full responsibility. We did fall in love. Edward was a beast. And has nothing to do with it, has it? If you'd known him, you'd realize that it had a great deal to do with it. He deserved to die. Life is cheap here in the Malay States. Good men have been dying. He wasn't a good man. He was a beast. And I took the emergency and used it to my advantage. To Catherine's advantage. You met him when he came back from Singapore? Yes, I drove my lorry to meet him. I feigned engine trouble, and when he got out, I shot him and drove away. But I didn't tell Catherine until after I'd done it. Do you want to go into town to give your story to Constable Downs, or shall I send in for him? I'll go in. If you wouldn't mind, I'd appreciate it if I could go to my estate first. It's close to dark. I'd appreciate it. We'll go in the jeep, then. I've got two armed men in there. All right, Mr. Dollar. I won't say goodbye to Catherine. If we could leave now. Oh, you're carrying an automatic. I'd better take that. All right, we can go now. It was too close to dark when we swung into the last mile of his estate. The jungle seemed to press in closer than ever. The orange sun had sunk below the trees by the time we reached the house. The guard was set, and I wondered if I'd spent another night with a Thompson in my hand. We walked into the house, and there faced a man I didn't recognize until Stuart screamed his name. French! French, but how? An emaciated Edward French, a scarecrow, half alive and holding a pistol in his hand. French? Edward? Yes, Keith. No, Edward, no! You are Edward French? Yes, I am Edward French. I'm still alive. I stayed alive so I could come back and face the man who thought he'd killed me. I was Catherine. Uh, Edward? I'm dead. You should have known that I wouldn't die. I didn't die, Keith. Keith was going in to give himself up, French. You won't have to now. Now, wait a minute. Let things go the way they're going. I know how things are going. I don't know you, but don't try to stop me. Edward. Look, Edward, there's, there's nothing I can say. Nothing I can say, but, but Edward, there must be something... Give me that thing, French. Sure. There it is. Well, I've shown them a thing or two around here. Yeah? You sure have. Expense account item four, same as items one and three, transportation back to the States and Hartford. Item five, miscellaneous, $200. Expense account total, $2,739.50. Remarks? The story of French being left for dead and driving to a settlement hospital is too long to cover here. But he did, without letting anybody know who he was. The last I saw of him, he was being booked for murder himself. I had no idea that a cup of tea might have all this background. But I was there. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dodd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is the Paramount Pictures production, The Redhead and the Cowboy. Featured in tonight's cast were Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre... Tudor Owen, Maria Palmer, and Dan O'Herlihy. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
For more adventure and mystery tonight, CBS brings you Hopalong Cassidy, Gangbusters, and Broadway is My Beat on most of these same CBS stations. Stay tuned now for Larry Lasseur with five minutes of the latest news, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed our latest adventure with insurance investigator Johnny Dollar. And don't forget tomorrow, going live from 5 p.m. Well, and it will be going live because I'm going to make sure that I don't miss it and mess up this time. So I do apologize. Is A Man Called X. And that is an episode called Rembrandt in Rio. It's going to be really, really good. Please do. It's Sunday tomorrow. So most importantly, can you make sure you check out our new podcast, Sunday Night Mystery. But for now, look, I'll be with you seven days a week, each and every week, and I'll see you tomorrow on Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Love you. Bye. <laughs>